morning, everyone. It's great to see you here today. And even though I can't see the folks that are online or on demand, we're really grateful that you're taking time uh, out of your day to join us as well. In fact, could we just let them know how much we appreciate them being part of our church family this morning? <clears throat> so how you doing? <laughs> Well, there's one really good, and the rest I don't have any usable information on. Um, a question that's worth asking is why church? A lot of times we focus on what is church, but why? And uh, what I can tell you is um, there are a lot of people who, when they look at some experiences in church history, uh, they're highly frustrated by inconsistencies and outright failures. And uh, you can't be honest about the history of the church without acknowledging uh, there have been times when the church has gotten significantly off track and was basically unrecognizable from the original mission that Jesus created it with. And in cases where that has been acknowledged and confessed, the church has been able to get back on track. And that's why the church exists to this day. If all it was was examples of, of moral failures and, and preying on people's superstitions and fears and burdening people with guilt and shame, uh, the church would have died out uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, so this morning, we're going to take a look at what the founder of the church actually thought the church could be. And we are in Matthew the eight, or 16th chapter, beginning in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So, what are you hearing people say about me? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Uh, humans actually didn't invent the church. Humans do not own the church. Humans do not build the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And so he starts out with a couple of questions. The first question is just asking what general consensus is about who he is and what he is about. But then he narrows the question to who do you think that I am? And this is critical to our understanding of Christianity because Christianity, our faith, is not a collection of opinions. This frustrates some people because they wish the church was more flexible with whatever the flow of culture is. But our faith is not a collection of popular opinions. But Jesus is still interested in what we think, not because he's insecure about who he is or our connection to him. What he knows is that what we think has a huge impact on how we live. The way you are living is the direct result of the thoughts you are thinking. The things that you believe, that affects how our life gets lived out. And so Jesus hones in on this idea that we have to think something about him that will make a difference in our life. And so uh, he declares that his, his, his um, uh, something really interesting. By the way, what I'm about to say now, I will acknowledge there's a fair amount of disagreement in Christianity about and I reserve the right to be wrong. I also reserve the right to be right. Maybe I'm right on this one. Uh, there are lots of people who believe that when Jesus said, 
On this rock I will build my church, who he's referring to is Peter. And the beginning of uh, an organization or an organism that would flourish throughout the world, but always takes its delegated authority back to Peter. I actually have a slightly different thought about that. I don't think that uh, Peter should be in any way demeaned or undervalued for the role that he played. But the word Peter, which is a nickname that, uh, that Jesus uh, gave him, actually means stone. So when he, says, when he says, on this rock, he's not referring to Peter per se. He's saying, you are a stone and on this rock. So this is what I think Jesus is saying. Peter blurted out, by the way, that was Peter's MO. Peter often blurted out. Uh, my favorite verse about Peter in the Bible is this. It, this is what it says. Peter did not know what to say, so he said. That's Peter. He just, he has to say something. He can't stand silence. It makes him uncomfortable. He likes to go first. He likes to be loud. And so he just said, you are the son of God. And, and, and this is what Jesus says. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That, I think, is the rock. Listen to it like this. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven, and on this rock I will build my church. God's ability to reveal things to us that's not dependent on flesh and blood is how the church gets built. I think that's a true thing. And so he comes to us, and, and, and here's the challenge. Uh, our culture will often deny truth. Uh, institutions will defy truth. Um, and God has put his followers in the middle of very difficult, demanding, and dangerous places. And what he expects is the church to be able to flourish wherever it is. And the amazing thing is it does when it's being the church. Prevailing thought and prevailing winds are no match for a prevailing church. So how does Jesus build his church? And I've got one sentence that I'm just going to break down into three parts for you this morning. And the first is Jesus is building a people. Jesus is building a people. On this rock, I will build my church. And he's including every tribe and every language and every age. Aren't you glad Jesus wants everyone to be in on what he is doing. Is that good news? I think it really is. In, in history, there's, there's life before Christ, BC, before the cross, and life after the cross. And just like it's true in human history, it's true in individual lives. There is our life before we come in contact with Christ and then since we've been in contact with Christ. So what is Jesus' mission? And he tells us in Luke 19, he has come to seek and to save those who are lost. That's his mission. He also tells us in John 10, he says, I have come that you might have life to the full. And then in 1 John 3, it says this, he says, he has come to destroy the works of the devil. What is Jesus calling us to do? Jesus is calling us to seek and to save the lost. He is calling us to help pour abundant, full life into others. And he's calling us to help to dismantle and destroy the works of hell against others' lives. That's what he's calling us to do. The church is for everyone and for any age. That's why we have a full complement. How many are glad that we allow, in fact, encourage children to participate in worship? Yeah, some of you are unsettled about that. And, 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 uh, and some of you who are parents wish you had an option uh, that maybe they would just be taken care of someplace else. But here's the thing. At every stage of our life, we deal with different issues. For children, a lot of their understanding of faith is connected to their honoring and trying to please their parents. And that does not undermine its value in any way. They see something in their parents that they think is worthwhile. That they, they see there's value to it. It's hard to describe. In fact, they're unable to do so. But they will make a commitment themselves to, to Christ, even though they don't understand most of what the gospel entails because of something that they've seen in their parents. That's a good thing. And then there's a point at which we understand we need protection from ourselves. Our desires, our preferences, our, 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 our hormones, like they get us into trouble. If all we do is follow those, we will make the headlines of the paper in the way we don't want to. 
We will unsettle our lives and disintegrate our relationships. And so there are people who come to realize, I need the church because left to my own devices, I will do more damage than good. And then there comes a time when we have to integrate our faith and reason that we've, we've heard and we've become familiar with the incredible things that God has done throughout human history, but we're also exposed to things that are going on in our culture and also science, and we wonder, can these things integrate? And so there are people who learn to integrate their faith and the things that are going on, the information that they're, they're hearing about, their reason. And then there comes a time where we want to have a sense of purpose in life and to get a call. And the church plays such a huge role in helping people discover their call. And by the way, it's not just to be a pastor or just to be on staff in a, in a church family. That There's something about understanding your purpose in life. And once you understand it, it will fuel you for the rest of your life. And the church plays a key role in that. Or maybe you'll live to the point where you realize there's a lot less days ahead in your future than there were in your past. You understand that. And you start thinking about how many days do I have left? And when you know that the clock is running out, facing death requires a lot of faith. You know, sometimes young people think that older people don't need all that much faith. And what I can tell you is when you're looking death in the face, faith is the only thing that works. The church is for every age. So technically, we didn't come to church today. We came with the church today. We are the church. These are just facilities. And we get to come here. So Jesus is building a people and empowering them. Jesus is building a people and empowering them. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom does anybody remember the first time one of your parents gave you the keys to the car? Do you remember? No? I do. I remember thinking that this was a rite of passage in some way. I was now being allowed to go out and drive the family car without someone being in it to supervise me. And I felt all of this responsibility. I could now go where I wanted to go because I had the keys to the car. Jesus gives his keys of the kingdom and he wants every member of his church to be fully enfranchised. I want you to be able to go places that I have called you. I want you to be able to do things. I'm going to open and unlock your understanding. I'm going to open and unlock opportunity. I am giving you the keys to the kingdom, a fully enfranchised body of Christ. And that brings with it real authority. And here's the thing about authority. It's not listed in a title. A title doesn't give authority. Whatever authority I have, it is not because the, the, the term pastor exists before my name. If you want to know more about authority, I can give you just two quick sentences about it. And that's this, God's authority, the way we connect with it is in worship and the way it flows through our lives is through submission. If you're not worshiping and if you're not submitting, whatever authority you're operating on is only your own. When we engage in worship, we connect with God's authority. When we submit, it flows through our lives. It's a very powerful truth. So what has God made you to be and what has God called you to be? And here's the thing, our world changes. Our world will change one life at a time, one home at a time. God will empower you to fulfill his mission. He isn't here to empower us to fulfill our missions. He wants to empower us to fulfill his mission. So um, this means that people f struggle with the church based on this concept. A lot of people think that God needs to change. And like there's actually a verse in the Bible that says he doesn't change. And so people feel like if he had more updated information, he would change. And we get frustrated by some of the guidelines that God gives us, often because we don't understand two things. What are the consequences of breaking those guidelines? And secondly, what is the motive for him giving them to begin with? And God is always motivated by love. 
And so there are some people who approach the church that they're going to change God. Or No, that's not how it works. The reason we come to, to a facility like this and, be, and we're part of the church is so that we can experience change. We're the ones that need to be changed. And our goal is to provide an environment for that to happen. So Jesus is building a people. And he's building a people and empowering them to what? To bring life and freedom to those going through hell. That's what he teaches in this passage. The gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overcome it. This is a really strange picture, and it's almost opposite of everything that we hear about the church. Because this is how the church is most often portrayed, right? The church is portrayed as a kingdom or an organization, and, and, and we're under attack. The church is under attack. And, and so we have to defend ourselves. In fact, songs have been written about this. There's a famous hymn from Christian past that says, hold the fort for I am coming. You know, this idea that, that, that we're, we're huddled up in this holy huddle and, and we're, we're, we're reinforcing ourselves against the assaults. And, and Jesus, that's not what he says. He says, it's the kingdom of hell that has gates, not the church. Hell is the walled community. And when he refers to it, he's, he's not talking about a, a, a place of final destination for eternity. What he's talking about is, is, is the, the institutional and, and philosophical concepts of intent to destroy the best things in human beings because we've been created in God's image. And so what Jesus says is, we are not a defense organization hoping we can hold out for at least as long as we live or until he returns. What Jesus says is, we are an invasion in, in institution and we go into the places where other people have been taken captive and our goal is to bring the life of Jesus and the love of Jesus to them and help bring them out of that. This is a, an incredible turnaround of how we think about ourselves. Most Christians just see themselves as, I hope I can hold out however long that, that declaration is in their own mind. And it's not how Jesus sees. He says, the kingdom of hell has gates, and gates have two purposes. One is they inhibit passage. When the gates are closed, no one gets out and no one gets in. And secondly, it's the place where in the ancient world, all the leaders, all the governing officials, all of those in authority would gather and they would devise their strategies for the development of their kingdom and for the protection of their kingdom. And what Jesus is saying is, the gates of hell will not prevail against an invading church. That's quite a different way to think about it. So. The way we can understand this, there are people who are caught, they're trapped. It's like they're behind closed gates in addictions that are destroying their lives and their relationships and others with others. There can be a sickness that decimates their body and reduces both their quality and their quantity of life. Some people feel like they're in a constant fog of confusion. They can't sort anything out. They can't figure anything out, even things that should be simple. They just seem stuck. There are people who are in a darkness that causes continued stumbling. Just about the time they get their balance and get up, they go down again. There are people who are separated from hope. There are people who, who cannot discover or figure out what their intended purpose is in life. There are people who are so afraid they're completely paralyzed and can barely get up and get out the door on any given day. There, are, there is a place where dreams dreams die, where hopes die, where relationships die, and a place where pain is so great that has been inflicted on us or by us that it seems like there's no hope beyond this. And what Jesus is saying, that represents the gates of hell, and the gates of hell will not prevail, or the, 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 the gates of hell will not prevail against an assaulting church, that we're invading to help bring life and love to those who live in those experiences. The forces of hell have taken their counsel and they've devised their strategy and they've, they've slammed shut their gates. But Jesus is building a church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. That's a good place for an amen. It really is. The church comes together to grow and then we go. We go to places that God sends us 
We help bring what we've experienced here to others. We, this is part of who we are, who God has called us to be. We help people get to heaven. Some people think that's the only thing the church does. That's our redemptive mission. That we can spend eternity with God. But we also have a mission to help heaven get into us, and that's the ministry of restoration. And that's part of what the church does too. When we get together, our mind is renewed because our culture is absolutely brilliant and persistent about saturating our thoughts with the way we're supposed to see things. When we get together, we experience and we practice acceptance because our world says that if you don't agree with something that they said, that you're rejected. You're rejected. And a lot of people confuse acceptance with approval, and they're not the same thing. And the church is a place where we can be accepted. A church is a place where, where we're encouraged to be brave. Just think about it. How much bravery is there actually in our world? Not nearly enough. Life presents a, a constant drain on our willingness to be brave or to demonstrate courage. And what we need is something poured into us that will help make us brave. That's not the same as just coming together to feel better for a little while. Something needs to be poured in us that activates us. And the church does that. We come together so that we can live out our faith. We're equipped to go out because talent is useless if it's not developed and gifts are worthless if they're not distributed. We need training. We need practice. We need opportunity. We need feedback. And when we get those things, it brings change to our world. I think the church has forgotten how to influence I don't think we think about influence. We think more about control. We fight instead of persuade. The early church didn't have that option. There wasn't anybody in the culture who agreed with them. And yet look what they were able to do. If enough hearts change, our culture changes. But the reason so many people prefer to fight rather than to try to persuade is because they have no confidence that God can change other people's hearts. And I wonder if it's because their heart never changed. Just their behavior. The church is called to be an influence. So this is a great story uh, from the Old Testament and one of its more notable prophets. And his name is Jeremiah. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. The unimaginable had happened to the nation that had devoted itself to following God. They had been invaded. The most skilled and educated, the strongest and, and best of their society had been relocated to Babylon, which was 700 miles away. In that place, and this wasn't just a few people, thousands taken out of their homes, away from their families, out of their cities, and relocated to a place that bore no resemblance of anything they knew. The language was unintelligible. The faces, unrecognizable. The customs were strange. The food was unappetizing. Nothing was familiar. They were in Babylon, and they were in exile. They were in Babylon, and they were in exile. In some ways, we feel like that sometimes too, don't we? I feel like I don't fit and I don't belong and I don't understand anything that anybody is saying. Or the world has changed so much from the way that it used to be, I don't recognize it anymore. And in that group, there were some religious leaders and they were intensely frustrated and they felt that this had been horribly unjust. They were very upset, it had been unfair. And out of their frustration, they had imaginations of a quick rescue operation where God would do something miraculous. And, and out of that imagination, they would tell those thousands of, of people in exile in Babylon, don't get too comfortable. Any second, any minute, God is coming to get you out of this. And it wasn't true. Whatever their motives were, it was still a false vision and a false dream. And here's the problem. You can't cling to a false dream and live a full life. It's not possible. Being reminded of what you have lost won't move you into your future. It doesn't work that way. 
And one day, two men come to Babylon. They had made the 700 mile journey from Israel. And everybody in the, that, were, that were the captives gathered around. Maybe they would have news of how their families were doing or what was happening back home. And they unrolled a scroll, a letter from Jeremiah who had heard from God. And Jeremiah gave them very wise counsel. You can find it in Jeremiah chapter 29. God was speaking into their lives again and this is what he was saying. Build where you are. Build houses. Be good neighbors. Plant gardens where you are. Plant good things that grow in the climate that you are in. Love where you are. Get married. Have children. Let your children get married. Celebrate life where you are. Pray where you are. And then he tells them what to pray for. And this is just, it's so unsettling to hear it. He says, pray for the prosperity of the city that you have been called to, that you've been carried to, because if it prospers, you will prosper. It'd be so easy. I can't pray for Babylon. They ripped me away from my family. My family might not even be alive because of them. I've been taken away from everything that mattered to me, and I've had everything that mattered to me taken away, and they're the ones responsible. I will not pray for their prosperity. And that's what the prophet says. You build where you are. You plant where you are. You love where you are, and you pray where you are for the prosperity of the city. God is looking for people in his church that will partner with him. God is looking for available people that will do what he's asking them to do. And when that happens, out of hell's prison house comes men and women and children and families. Satan's strategies wind up being thwarted and Jesus is honored and glorified. There has to be a place like that left in this world. There has to be for people who are losing hope and they don't understand either the purposes of God or his love. There has to be a place for them. For people who under the pressures of life and facing the temptations of life are just being battered about, there has to be a place for them. The church has to be a place where the loving arms of God reaches out to those who are lost, a place where they can find his love regardless of what they have done. And there must be a place where, and there's, there's so few of these now, a place where shame meets grace. This must be that kind of place. Jesus is building his church, and this is the most amazing thing, is when we are a place like this, what we see is not who's on the platform. What we see is not who has a title. What we see is Jesus, and he is lifted up. Let's all stand to our feet this morning.